we're looking at how to look like a church. And I want to start in actually verse 13 here. It's the very end of this chapter 5. We've been in every chapter. I hope that you've continued to read James, and I know that many of you have, and you've set out in the narthex that you've seen new things that you haven't seen before in your reading. Here he's talking about prayer and the prayer of faith the prayer of those who are part of a faith community, a church, a body of believers. So listen to God's word to you. Are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Elijah was a human being like us, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth yielded its harvest. My brothers and sisters, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and almighty God, even as we open your word, we pray that you will open our eyes, open our hearts, open our ears for that truth that you would have for us, that we might then live that truth and apply that truth as your children, as the church of Jesus Christ. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you were to be asked to describe Highland Presbyterian Church, what would you tell someone? Would you start out with location and Say it's just north of 30 off Oregon Pike and and where it is. How about the beautiful sanctuary that we're sitting in and, and the gorgeous pipe organ that we hear play? Or would you maybe talk about the recently added multi-million dollar addition and, and how that's changed Highland? How would you describe the church? You may start out with something about building and, or proximity or landmark, but at some time in your description to your friend, you need to describe the people and the program and the purpose that drives this church, Highland. It's much easier to describe brick and mortar, isn't it, than it is to describe mission and vision. Well, how do you look like a church. Now, I was just talking with someone out in the narthex after the earlier service, and we talked about years ago that might have been somewhat of an insignificant question because most people knew how to answer it. But I tell you, this is a pertinent question. It's a cutting-edge question right now. How to look like the church. What is church? Let me give you two examples that have happened in the last month which are sharing with us the importance of church for today. Some of you know that a month ago, a new denomination was begun in the Presbyterian tradition. Now, I know that you know that there's a PCA church. There's Westminster right down the road. There's an EPC church, Evangelical Presbyterian Church. There's a Reformed. There's an Orthodox. There are several types of church. We're the PC USA. We're kind of the the mothership. We're the largest. We've been around the longest. Now there is another denomination of as of last month. It's called the Evangelical Covenant Order of Presbyterians, E C 
O, eco, an ecosystem, a spiritual eco. They have um, somewhat reacted to some of the changes that have happened in the constitution of the Presbyterian Church USA by the General Assembly and by the majority of the Presbyteries. They have defined what they think a church ought to look like by two papers, a polity paper, which is church government, and a theology paper, which uh, are on the internet for anyone to read. They have a mission statement. It's called, To Build Flourishing Churches That Make Disciples of Jesus Christ, which sounds like a very good way to put your faith into action to me. Sounds like a good definition of church. But apparently, the ECO doesn't think that the current church is doing this such that they need to begin another denomination. So that's the answer to the question for them, how to look like a church. Now you and I have seen many changes in the Peace USA church in the last couple of decades. Some of them are too radical for you. Some of them are not radical enough. We need changes in church. We need changes with bold, courageous, decisive, innovative, risk-taken, entrepreneur leadership led by the Holy Spirit. Those kind of changes we need. But we have also seen in history, both past and recent, that Purity by separation has been tried before. And I agree with those who say that this new entity that develops in this separation will just deteriorate a little more slowly. For the record, the best way to look like church is not by splitting Secondly, last month, something on YouTube came out. It is titled, Why I Hate Religion But Love Jesus. The video has gone viral, which, as you know, means it's like a virus. It's spreading. 18 million people have seen it in the last month, and that number is growing exponentially. It is... A video by 22-year-old Jefferson Bethke, who created a four-minute spoken word video that has captured the attention of a large number of people who are attracted to Jesus, but not attracted to the church, who are believing in Christian teachings, but who are not following organized religion. In language that is much more at home in Christian rap, and this video was just studied in the um, Tom Whitworth's class, Faith Cafe, thank you. And, and that would have been a very interesting discussion because here is a young 22-year-old who's standing in the courtyard and rhyming his belief with things like, I mean, if religion is so great, why has it started so many wars? Why does it build huge churches but fail to feed the poor? His vision of the church is this. If grace is water, then the church should be an ocean. It's not a museum for good people. It's a hospital for the broken. You see, how to look like church is a question that people are asking today. But how do you look like the church that Jesus started? That church which Jesus said to Peter, that on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That church, it's still on the minds of people. It's in the mainline denomination of the Presbyterian Church. It's in 18 million YouTube viewers. It, it's within this congregation as it is in many what is the church? And that was in the mind of James when he says that churches need three different criteria or dynamics that I see in this end of his book right here. And I want to share them with you. Easy to understand. Communication, 
celebration and commitment. Notice James doesn't say anything about a sanctuary or a fellowship hall. He's describing what a church is by describing how its members put their faith into action. So first, church is about communication. Specifically, communication through prayer. This should be the most important and obvious distinction within a church, a reliance on prayer. James writes, are any, are, are any among you suffering? They should pray. If you read in the New International Version, it says, are any of you in trouble? Then you should pray. Sometimes we pray in joyful celebration. Sometimes we pray in intercession on behalf of other people. Many times we pray on some kind of suffering for, uh, because of some kind of trouble. This is what James is saying should be the mark of the church. Prayer to communicate with God. Scripture teaches us that the house of the Lord should be a house of prayer. And this is perhaps what we do best as a community of faith is to pray. I often hear many of you say, would you pray about this? Or, or I'll pray for this. Or just as I asked you earlier to pray for Joyce Parker and her extended family. We intercede for one another, both within our community and outside our community as well. And it always makes me happy when someone will say, well, I've, I've had you on my prayer list. And I know that every day that person's lifting me or that cause up. Prayer is the way that we communicate with the Almighty. Alone, together, in silence, outspoken. Prayer is the way that people of faith communicate with their God. James emphasizes this even more in verse 16 when he says, the prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. But practical James goes even further by putting flesh with his prayers, speaking about the spiritual leaders in the church. In verses 14 and 15, Are any among you sick? They should call the elders, the elders of the church, and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. As, as a pastor of over 30 years, I've had many wonderful opportunities to pray with and for people, but one that I will never forget is when I received the phone call of a young mother and asked to pray for Colby Kennett. Colby was four weeks old. The doctor said that they think he might have had a slight stroke when he was born. And she specifically asked for the elders. All 12 elders in that South Carolina church where I remember them around that hospital bed anointing that little four-week-old baby with oil and laying hands on that baby and praying. Colby will always have some difficulties, but I just received a, a Facebook message from his mother that he's doing fine. Prayer. Highlanders. Let us put our faith into action by always communicating through prayer. Well, church is to be a community of celebration. The church is a place where we have all kinds of causes to celebrate and for all kinds of reasons. In verse 13 it says, Are any of you cheerful that they should sing songs of praise? we just opened up our worship service for that wonderful hymn, Come Sing, O Church in Joy. Because we are celebrating the opportunity to gather together as believers in this community of faith to lift our praise to Almighty God. 
as a worshiping community in celebration. Through the beautiful music that's offered by the choir, to the playing with Jonathan on the organ, to guitars and drums with Chris and all of those in the contemporary service, to all of you singing these words that mean so much to the hymns in the sanctuary. We are celebrating on account of our faith that believes Jesus Christ who said, take courage, I have conquered the world. Because of our faith that proclaims that Jesus Christ was crucified, dead, and buried on the third day he rose again from the grave. Because of our faith that celebrates a Savior who promises eternal life through faith in him. Because of a faith that says, I will give you the Holy Spirit. Because it's tough down here to live a difficult life and we need all the help we can get. That's celebrating life through praise and adoration. We were just studying last Wednesday in the um, W3C study on David, Habits of the Heart, and we're looking at the person of David, and he was so jubilant, so celebrative, that in, he, he was dancing before the Lord. Well, his wife was very embarrassed about that. And she told him, do not do that anymore. She would have made a good Presbyterian. <laughs> but he couldn't help it. He just was so deep in love with God that he had to dance in joy before the Lord. Celebration is just an expression of the joy that Jesus brings deep in our hearts. It doesn't depend on your external circumstances or the particular moment of the time. It's something deep down in your soul. The joy that resides there because it is salvation of your soul that you're joyful about. Well, that's cause for celebration. And we celebrate all the time. Next week, we'll celebrate with the sacrament of baptism with with Zachary Book. We'll celebrate the witness of the power of the resurrection with Joyce Parker. We have celebrations from beginning to end and all in between. Highlanders, let us put our faith into action as a community filled with celebration. Church is a commitment as well. A commitment to caring. James is a people person. We know that. His book is strewn with examples of how to do for others. But especially in this passage, in verses 19 and 20. Are any of you suffering, he says? Are any sick? Confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. If anyone wanders from the truth and is brought back by another, you should know that whoever brings back a sinner from wandering will save the sinner's soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. James is painting a picture of a community that is committed to caring for others. Well, they would never toot their own horn, so I'll say that as a church, we are very proud of the Highland Mission groups that go to places like Alabama and drove the 16 hours, 15 hours back, 14, what's a few hours among friends, 14 hours back from Alabama to work a week for other people. The outreach council, the local missions, the dozens of organizations that we do, in so many, uh, that we participate in so many ways here at Highland, all for the sake of other people outside of this church, but also those people inside the church, from the people who are one-on-one prayers with others. I see people meeting in the library or in the chapel or in rooms, one-on-one, or in Stephen ministry groups or visitations to the hospital. We care for people inside our community as well in times of joy, and in times of sorrow or grief. As Highlanders, let us continue our strong tradition of putting our faith into action with a strong commitment to caring. So next time someone asks you, well, tell me a little bit about that church, Highland. Be sure to remember James' criteria And tell them that that we have a strong sense of communication through prayer. 
that we have a celebrative spirit here because we are a community of faith and that we are living a commitment to caring for others. Along with those three ways of being the church, I want to add a fourth C on how to look like a church. And that C is Christ. Maxie Dunham tells a wonderful story of the little boy that's going to bed. And his mother is tucking him in and he's afraid of the dark. And he says, I don't want to be alone in the dark. I want someone to stay with me. And so she says, well, God is with you. And to that, the little boy sadly said, well, I want somebody with skin on their face. (laughs) Well, you and I know that that somebody is Jesus Christ. Our Lord, our Savior, the incarnation, God's Son coming down to be human, is the one who had skin on his face just like you and I do. Remember Highland's motto is people following Jesus. Well, it's people following Jesus Christ. And that each of us is called to be a follower and called to, as Dietrich Bonhoeffer says, to be little Christs to others. And so no matter how you say it, no matter how you want to define church, no matter how you want to say it looks, what it looks like to be a church, the answer is going to come back, you and I are the church. You and I personify what the church is with skin on our face, as little Christs to others. Your life, whatever you do and say, may be the best description of this church that others will ever see. How to be the church. So let's read James over and over And remember to apply this manual of practical Christianity in our daily lives as individuals and as a church. Let's put our faith into action, as he says, to be doers of the word. That our church, Highland, will be known in the Lancaster community as the church which communicates through prayer, which is a a community of celebration, which is committed to caring for others and is filled with people following Jesus Christ. That's how to look like a church. That's how you and I can be the church. We're going to try to show a video. It didn't work at the early service, so you might have a a little extra if it'll work this time about what it is to be the church. Let's see if that'll work. Lately, it seems that we are getting more and more confused about what a church actually is. So let's take some time to set the record straight. Church is not a building, though a building can be used by a church. Church is not a denomination, though a set of beliefs should be important to a church. Church is not about Sunday, though a church should not forsake meeting together. Church is not about one person or personality, though every church should be pastored. And church is not about size or growth though every church is called to make disciples. So don't think of church as an address or a location, but rather think of church as mobile and on the move. Don't think of church as something built or planted, but rather think of church as something deployed. Don't think of church as where you are for an hour each week, but rather what you are every day of the week, because the church is the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Feet shouldn't sit still. Hands shouldn't be idle. Feet go hands do. This is the church. Church isn't what you're sitting through right now because you are the church. Now go and be the church. Thanks, Mark, for making that work. So... Next time someone asks you to describe Highland, you be the church. You tell them what church is like through your word, through your action. And let us say what it is that we believe in as the church. Would you stand and use the Apostles' Creed for the affirmation of faith? 
Let us say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From then she shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Highlanders, will you pray with me? Let us now communicate with the Almighty God. Let us pray. Gracious God, it is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise. Eternal God and Creator, you brought light out of darkness and set the sun to brighten the day and the moon and the stars to illuminate the light, the night. Your glory blinds the eyes of our sin while your radiance warms our needy hearts. You lead us by the light of your truth into the ways of righteousness and peace. Therefore, we praise you, joining our hearts with the heavenly choirs and all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing the glory of your name. Lead nations all over the world in ways of justice and peace. Protect simple, lowly human beings from those being led by the power of evil through terrorism. Help us support our troops. Give those who judge the spirit of righteousness and those who rule the world a measure of your wisdom to guide them to peace on this earth. Empower the church throughout the world in its life and witness. Break down the barriers that divide and, and unite in your truth and love. The church may confess your name, share one baptism, sit together at one table, and serve you in one common ministry. Strengthen this congregation in its work and worship. Lead us to serve you in our community. Help us to grow in understanding your gospel and being inspired to share with those to whom you lead us. Please give us new desires in the sense that our truest desire is to find our real joy in serving your will. We thank you and praise you that we may share our thoughts, our feelings, and what we believe to be our needs with you. We bring before you now all the troubles, all that troubles us, our failings, errors, and exaggerations, our tribulations and sorrows, and also our rebelliousness and bitterness, our whole life and our whole heart which you know better than we know ourselves. We place all this in the faithful hands which you have stretched to us in our Savior. Take us as we are. Raise up those who are weak. Enrich from your fullness those who are poor. We have many family members and friends who are suffering through illnesses in these times. We lift them to you in prayer. We pray for their healing and for the Holy Spirit's loving presence to be engaging in their daily lives. We seek to know your will for us in our lives, how we may serve you and share in your presence in our lives. Turn our thoughts, our feelings, and our choices to be guided by an awareness of the presence of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray the prayer he taught us to pray together. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, how will it be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you leave this sanctuary to be the church, remember that you are a child of God and that you bear the name of Jesus Christ. And so bear his name thankfully, for you are not your own. Bear his name gratefully, for you too were bought with a price. And bear his name joyfully, for he enlists each of us 
to put our faith into action to be the church. In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.